on to the topic at hand, and um, I would like to just spend a few minutes putting um, putting this into a context in terms of what are brain tumors and how common are they. And in fact, what we are talking about with primary brain tumors, meaning those kinds of tumors that arise from brain tissue, not tumors that spread to the brain from elsewhere. There are many different types, and in fact, the World Health Organization organization which classifies brain tumors, classifies over 126 of them. We're not going to speak about all of them today. Um, but each of them has a distinct biology and therapy. And gliomas are the most common of the primary brain tumors. And there are about 17,000 new people diagnosed each year with a malignant glioma. And just to put that in a context, there are about 180,000 people in the United States diagnosed each year with breast cancer. So you can see it's a much less common disease than many of the other cancers you're aware of. Gliomas get their name from uh, the fact that they come from a type of cell in the brain called a glial cell. And this is not a nerve cell, so it's not the cells that you really think about when you think about the brain. And the word glia means glue in the Greek, and actually these are the cells that hold the brain together, literally, and help connect the nerve cells to each other. It is the main cell in the brain, and there are two predominant types called astrocytes and oligodendroglia, um, and we're going to come back to that. Now the cause of brain tumors is for the most part unknown. There are only a few risk factors that have ever been identified as uh, potentially leading to a brain tumor, and the main one is that of prior radiation therapy. So some people may have received radiation therapy to the head or neck region for another purpose, perhaps years before, and then that will increase their risk of a subsequent brain tumor. Uh, there are other things that have been described in the literature, such as head trauma or petroleum exposure, aspartame or NutraSweet, but all of these things have really been inconclusive, and the relationship with a brain tumor, if any, is really very weak. Cell phones, in my opinion, do not cause brain tumors. Um, I use a cell phone. Uh, the data are uh, not convincing at all, and very rarely are brain tumors part of a genetic syndrome. Now, the brain is a particularly challenging organ of the body to have a tumor. Um, it is not a homogeneous organ the way the lung or the liver uh, or even the colon is. So you could take out the left lung and you can completely survive with the right lung. It doesn't compromise in any way your ability to get oxygen. Um, but in the brain, that's not true. And symptoms from a brain tumor are related not just to the size of the tumor, but most importantly to the tumor location. And this becomes a big issue from a therapeutic point of view as well. So the brain is a compartmentalized organ. And one of the problems that we face is that healthy parts of the brain cannot necessarily assume the function of a part of the brain that is sick or not working well. So unlike the left lung that can take over and, and expand even a bit to accommodate loss of a right lung, the right side of the brain cannot necessarily take over when the left side of the brain is compromised. And this can be particularly challenging when thinking about treatment, and I know Dr. Guten's going to get into this So uh, when we come to surgery. So this is just a picture of a normal human brain. You see all these squiggles. They all look the same, right? You can't really tell one squiggle from the other. But in fact, they are extremely different. Now, unfortunately, this brain is now facing a different way. This is the front, the eyes, this is the back. And these color-coded areas designate some of the different or main functions that, uh, that we have. So the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. This red strip is the motor function, uh, meaning your ability to voluntarily move your arm and leg on the opposite side. The blue strip controls sensation. And for example, this purple area in the back here controls vision. And so when we have someone with a brain tumor, and this is an MRI, um, kind of in the same plane as that picture, here a brain tumor in this area, you can imagine that this person's vision is going to be affected, but 
their sensory and motor function is not going to be affected. So this, the, the kinds of symptoms that you have are all related to where in the brain the tumor occurs. And that might be, as you talk among yourselves, you realize that some of you may have very different kinds of experiences than others. This is another MRI picture. This is a typical kind of a picture. This is a normal brain. And this is a, uh, a brain with, uh, from someone who has a glioblastoma. And you see that it is here on the, this is actually the right side of the brain. Um, and this white area outlines the predominant site of the disease. Now, as good as imaging is, diagnosis can only be established by a pathologist. And this requires a surgical procedure of some sort, a biopsy, a resection, uh, et cetera. And the point I just want to make here is that pathology is an interpretation. And actually, the pathology report is usually a description, and then the pathologist gives his interpretation, meaning how they view the entire picture that they're looking at, um, and then they, they draw conclusions and make a diagnosis. So pathology is not an absolute. It's not like measuring the blood sugar uh, level where everybody would agree, yes, the blood sugar is 100. Um, and this is sometimes cause for discrepancy in pathology interpretation where one doctor says one thing and another doctor says another thing. And I think that's probably one of the things that is hardest for um, non-professionals to really understand. It requires a lot of expertise for a correct diagnosis, and these tumors are particularly challenging because they can be mixed. They, they can have a low-grade and a high-grade component, and they can have different cell types um, involved. So sometimes it's truly in the eye of the beholder. And we, along with really everybody uh, in throughout the world, use the World Health Organization classification. And I'm not going to get into the details of this, but just to say that they are fundamentally divided into two groups, low grade and high grade. I personally do not like the word benign because I don't really view these as uh, completely benign tumors. Um, and this can be grade one, or most of them are grade two. And you can have uh, low-grade astrocytomas, low-grade oligodendrogliomas, and then you can have higher-grade versions of the same thing. And they are into two categories, grade three and grade four, both of which are high-grade, and they have these names, anaplastic astrocytoma, anaplastic oligodendroglioma, uh, and the glioblastoma. The word anaplastic really just means malignant. So just in conclusion, brain tumors are really quite rare uh, in comparison to other cancers. The cause is completely unknown, and the vast majority of people, really fewer than 5% do we ever have a clear identifiable risk factor or trigger. Symptoms are related to the location of the uh, brain in which the tumor occurs, and also to the speed of growth of the tumor and to the ultimate size that is present at the time you, um, the person comes to medical uh, attention. And that malignant gliomas in particular are challenging to diagnose and also to treat, and we're going to spend time on treatment, and that expertise and really multidisciplinary collaboration is needed to do the best job.